Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. My name's Tom Fardner. I'm a chair and organiser of Grand Rounds. It's um, a bit of a huge turn um, during, during this week because uh, we were hoping to hear from Chris Pell, one of our psychiatry colleagues, who is going to talk about the uh, mental health impact of COVID during lockdown, etc. Um, but unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond his control, he's not able to speak today. So I cancel Grand Rounds. And then um, Lynn Urquhart, who is uh, three feet through this wall, because we have offices next to each other, um, said to me, well, I could come and give a talk. Can I stand in? So I'm delighted that Dr. Lynn Urquhart, uh, who is consultant in infectious diseases and general medicine uh, and the University of Dundee Medical School lead for assessment. I've probably got that wrong. Yeah, no, that's uh, right. That's right. Um, uh, who, she's going to come and talk to us about feedback. Now, um, Lynn is an expert in this. She did a PhD in uh, feedback um, and presented at Grand Rounds many years ago, I think. I remember you still speaking about your PhD. Um, so it's great to have you back, Lynn, to talk about feedback, uh, particularly in terms of the context in which it's given. Um, uh, and I suspect this, this uh, applies to not just students, but trainees and each other, speaking to feedback to peers, colleagues, friends. So Lynn, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you very much for standing in at the last minute. Any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, a quick reminder to mute your microphones if, you are, uh, if, you, um, uh, if you're not speaking. Uh, and that's it. Thanks so much, Lynn. That's brilliant. Thanks, Tom. OK, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, so I want to have a chat to you about feedback. And in particular, thinking beyond the information that goes into feedback, but thinking about what are the various factors that influence whether feedback is actually successful. So, um, sorry, let me just minimize this little window. There we go. So feedback is really important. And we know that it's one of the biggest influences on achievement. And it does that by increasing motivation, reducing anxiety, restructuring knowledge, encouraging the learner to reflect and becoming active participant in the learning process. However, it's not as easy as just give more feedback because actually, although this is an old paper, it was a massive um, meta-analysis of lots and lots of psychological papers, um, which showed that up to one third of feedback interventions actually have a detrimental effect on learning. So not only do they not help, but you might actually be harming or doing some harm with regards to learning. So we therefore need to understand not just what is feedback, but what is good feedback and what are the factors that influence feedback success. So it's super important for all of us who work in both undergraduate medical education and postgraduate training to recognise that feedback has two roles. Obviously, it's important for progression of learning, including things like knowledge, skills, behaviours and attitudes. But it's also really, really important for patient safety, because if we're not willing to both give feedback and receive feedback around things that we might improve upon, then we're potentially going to lead to harm for our patients. And this was a major factor that came up in the mid-staff report, which basically commented on a really poor culture of learning from mistakes and feedback. So something that's really important that we make sure we, we do well to ensure the safety of our patients. So here's the problem, is that most feedback interventions are based on this idea of feedback as information. So that's where information is provided from one person, a tutor, for example, to a learner in a kind of unidirectional way. But the problem with that model is that this information isn't just transmitted and received in the way in, in you know, it's not received, sorry, in the way it was transmitted because it undergoes a number of filters with in um, the tutor and the student or the, the trainee, whomever it might be, before that person will decide whether they're going to utilise that information. And these the feedback filters, as I call them, are, are multi-levels. So the level of the individual, the social and the cultural. And I wanted to have a wee chat with you about what each of those meant and therefore think about what impact that might have on the feedback that you provide. So. Oh, and before I get on to that, I also want to talk about this important uh, concept of the feedback gap, which is where those of us who are educators probably consistently and continuously feel like we're being asked to provide feedback. And yet at the same time, 
there's constant messages that students and trainees say they're not getting enough feedback. Now, those two things don't sound like they make sense together because how can you be providing more and more, yet the trainees feel like they're not getting more and more? And that is this concept of the feedback gap. So we also need to understand why there is this gap in understanding and perceptions of feedback. So if we go back to those feedback filters and we think about the individual factors, there's lots of different factors that relate to the individual student or learner and also um, relate to the individual who's providing the feedback. That's, for example, any emotions that that per person is going through at that particular time that they're receiving the feedback, particularly if those are negative emotions, the maturity of the learner, whether they're an undergraduate, postgraduate, um, and then in terms of relational factors, a really interesting and important relational factor in medicine is credibility. So um, some of the med ed literature says essentially, and I think this will probably resonate with most of us, if the person who is giving you feedback is not credible in your eyes, then you will discount that feedback. So if you think that that person is pretty crap at the thing that they're trying to give you feedback on, you're not going to accept that feedback from them. And then all, another relational factor are things like longevity of relationships and social networks. So there's loads and loads of filters and factors that impact the information. So what I really hope that you took away from this talk at the end is that the information is a tiny, tiny percent of feedback. But actually, it's all of these conceptual factors around the information that will ultimately determine whether it is valued and then utilised for improvement. There were these, uh, Chris Watling, who is a med ed researcher in Canada, um, published these papers, I suppose that's quite a few years ago now, but at the time I was doing my PhD, they were quite new, which basically showed that feedback culture at medical school within Canada, the students felt that informal feedback was rare, that formal feedback was tokenistic and tick boxy, that medical students often felt that they were a burden on placement, and that credibility related not to whether you thought someone was a good teacher, but to whether you thought they were a good doctor. And I think if we think of each of those points, I think we have to be honest with ourselves that that culture, whilst we would not want that to be the culture um, in medicine, it probably continues to be the culture in medicine within the UK also. And so if you will forgive me, I'm going to present to you a little bit of data from um, my PhD, which was done a wee while ago now, but I hope will um, be examples of what makes good and perhaps less good feedback so that we can understand through these examples how we might improve our own feedback. So during the PhD, I did two different studies. The first was um, across multiple medical schools um, and it was really asking students to share their stories of feedback. And by looking at the stories, understanding what stories they shared and how they shared those stories, I was then able to work out what seemed to make a good experience and a not so good experience. So interestingly, in terms of how students define feedback, they still unfortunately conceptualise it as a very much a one-way process, as something that happens to them rather than with them. And this was a quote, they, i.e. medical school, basically tell us how we're doing and any areas we need to work on. It's not great when we're, when we're thinking about um, dialogic feedback. It's still very much something that students feel happen to them rather than with them. Students were more likely to share uh, negative than positive experiences, but that's not unusual when you look at focus group studies because by asking people to share experiences, they often take the opportunity to share perhaps negative experiences that they've not had the chance to share before. So it's, it's not an unusual thing within the focus group literature for that to happen. But what's interesting is what makes a positive experience is not the opposite of what makes a negative experience. There's actually different factors that seem to make something poorer as seem to make something good. And so I think that's really interesting and important. So positive experiences, the students talked about them being constructive and specific that, you know, the person giving them feedback was actually there and able to comment in a, a credible way that the, the relationship was respectful between the student and the feedback provider and that there was some kind of balanced information. But if you look at the negative experience, the, the, the single most important thing that made a negative experience was that it had a negative emotional impact. 
So emotion doesn't really come up at all there in the positive experience, but comes up as the number one experience in what made a negative uh, uh, feedback uh, experience for students. So really important there. And there are aspects of the content so that it was maybe not standardized or constructive, but also where it related specifically to the student's personal characteristic or where there was a poor relationship between the student and the feedback provider. So negative experiences were about the emotion and the relationship and where it related to the student's personal characteristic and that's not the same thing as what made a positive experience so i want to just share examples of positive feedback so um this one here in the first few years at the end of every block you had a meeting with your facilitator they show you how you were progressing through the block which i actually thought was really good they've seen you twice a, good, a week they're in a good position to know to tell you whether you know stuff or not and another one uh, at the very end of it all as we were leaving he shook our hand and actually gave us a personal strength and weakness as we were leaving it was amazing so here we're talking about relationships and how those positive relationships and the respectful dynamic have created positive feedback experiences but also that there's been some sort of longitudinal relationship in both of these examples not just a one-off bit of information that's been provided if we then look at examples of negative experiences, and I want you to think about the language that students are using in this, and um, we can see very much where the where the emotion comes through. The first one, it was PBL and the women just laid into me, you're not doing this right and you're going to fail your exams. The facilitators don't really engage in you. It was fair, I was fairly annoyed because you build up a relationship of trust and I wasn't expecting it. And then another one, I was called into a meeting. I didn't find it constructive in any way. It was almost like they played good cop, bad cop. And I came out feeling a lot worse about myself. It just made me feel really bad about myself, just in general, not even in relating to this exam. It was just very negative. So here we can see these really negative emotional impacts, breakdown of relationship in both, both examples between the person providing the feedback and the person on the other end of the feedback. So... I looked up what the students shared, but also how do we look at how they shared it. And just whilst I appreciate this might be different in terms of the types of research that you might look at, I, it's, I want to open your eyes to different ways we can look at um, information. So I, how we look at the language that students used in their stories. Um, and what I found was when we look at the pronouns, that negative experiences were presented as them versus us. Um, where the students are on one side and the, the university are on the other, where positive experiences suggested a collegiality. So if we look at this first example, we as an example of a collaborative approach, well, I found that when I, because uh, I had to reset an ex anatomy exam, and I got, um, well, I went to see a tutor about it, and she sort of went over like through my results and what I'd got, and we looked at it and we focused on the areas we needed to improve, and I felt that was really useful. So you might have thought this could have been a negative experience. This is a student who's failed an exam and they've, they've been pulled in by a tutor, but actually they have felt that because that was a collaborative approach, that that was a positive experience. If we contrast it with the other example, well, I think they just do a lot of things. They try to do a lot of things to support us, but I don't think they are particularly successful. They give us the graphs, which are pretty good. They have never explained it to us once. So you can see here that if we're trying to improve the culture of feedback, one of the major things that we could do is try and improve the sense of adversarialness that of the them and usness to try and see what we can do to create a collegiate and collaborative feedback experience for students or trainees. I also looked at kind of the metaphors that they used and um, in a lot of the negative experiences, very much like feedback as war, um, the woman laid into me, she stabbed me in the back, she shot me down. So lots of very emotive languages in the negative experiences. Um, and also negative words. So if we look at this example, when I had my appraisal, I found it a very intense period. It was only... Oh, excuse me I need to just move this little thing here it was only a 10 minutes and I felt like I was being told that my personality doesn't quite fit into their mold and I came away from it very deflated and very angry and then we do a thing called and this was during my critical appraisal and that was the time that the tutor decided to tell me that my patient had actually died and was dead when I gave my talk and he pauses and is very upset and he says and I find that extremely disappointing so this is an example of 
when someone is feeling a negative emotion and is provided feedback during that episode of negative emotion, they will feel negative about that feedback, even if the feedback itself was not negative. Really important to understand the mindset and the, neg the emotional perspective in the moment that you're about to provide feedback, because if they are in a negative emotional state, i.e. tutors just told them that this patient that they've built up a relationship with is now dead, and that's, you know, had quite a significant effect on them, um, then actually the, the feedback they have put in they have conceptualized the feedback as negative and perhaps the feedback wasn't, perhaps the feedback was very appropriate, but the student had remembered the feedback as negative because they were in a, the emotional state was very negative. So I want to share, oh, sorry, I must have a wee timer on this. I want to share another example that looks at various things in terms of metaphors and, and negative emotional talk. And we can understand when we look at this, why this would be a negative experience, but I want to unpick it a little bit more. So we've done a session where you had to give your simulated patient information and then your tutor stopped you and gave you feedback on how well you did in front of a room full of your peers. And she told me that I, my shoulders are too tense and too square, which I can't help the shape of my shoulders. They're just how they are. That I look like a pointer dog and that I intimidate my patients. And I was very upset. I sat, I took it, I sat for the rest of the class and then I went home and cried. I didn't know what to do about that. Like, I know a few people felt that I should have complained about it, but I didn't really know what to say because she's a tutor and I suppose she thinks she's helping. And then I say, and did any of your colleagues that were there at the time comment to you? And another student, who is in the focus group um, comments, well, I was there. She was particularly and unnecessarily harsh and we all felt the same, like we didn't know where it came from. It was very unnecessary, particularly harsh, like the things she was saying. But again, it just made a really awkward atmosphere and you couldn't say anything at that point. And then the original student said, yeah, everyone was really nice to me afterwards. And they said, oh, I would have cried if she said that to me. I thought she was way harsh than you. But, um, and then I say, and were you able to take anything from that feedback? And the original student says, yeah, I think she might be a slightly bitter and twisted lady. So there's loads of aspects that come through this example. We can see that clearly it's not appropriate to tell a medical student that they look like a pointer dog. I mean, I think most of us with not very much training and feedback would know that that wasn't ideal. But what we can see is that through the way she shares this story, this had actually been two years previously, and the student still uses a lot of negative emotional talk. And so that tells us that this particular example, which the tutor, I suppose, may not have remembered because it may not have been memorable to the tutor, is incredibly memorable to the student. And two years down the line, the student still, really the relationship breakdown between the tutor and the student um, continues because the student still thinks that this tutor is bitter and twisted. And not only that, but the students who watched that episode also felt it. So what we can see when we think back to that slide I shared at the beginning that shows a third of feedback is actually detrimental, we can see that this episode would have been detrimental not only to the student who was on the other end of the feedback, because it's, it's damaged the relationship, it's made her feel bad about her physicality, it's, um, but it's also been detrimental to the relationship between the student and anyone that was watching. So this is a really, you know, strong example of how, you know, you can do harm with the wrong feedback and how that harm can last um, and, and therefore feedback has legacy. And I want to come on to that in a wee while. So that study basically just concluded that students still kind of see feedback as something that happens to them rather than with them, sadly, and that positive relationships however were inclusive and reflected a, a collaborative nature and a positive relationship um, but the negative experiences were very emotive and that emotion persisted down the line continuing to have students feel negatively not just about the feedback itself but about the the person that provided that feedback for them so the second part of the study was an ethnographic study looking at feedback at medical school. And what I did was basically with my little camcorder, I went in and filmed um, two different settings where teaching and learning was happened. And I, for eight weeks in each setting, filmed all the teaching and learning that happened that was possible. So I did that in a clinical skills teaching environment and then also in a workplace. 
I won an award in a teaching hospital. And I then examined and explored what kind of feedback had happened in each of those settings and tried to understand what impact the kind of context had on, on the feedback. But I also then showed the feedback clips back to students and tutors separately and asked the students and tutors to discuss those episodes so that I could understand where the feedback gap um, might exist. So I'm going to share some of the findings from that study. Just skip forward. OK, so how do we look at who gave the feedback, who instigated it, who received it, what was the environment like at the time, who else was there, what kinds of feedback, what was the learning activity, did anyone signpost the feedback, and what was the feedback style? And I had a look in the workplace and also in the clinical skills setting. And what I found was that loads of feedback was happening. So in clinical skills footage, there was 144 episodes of feedback, which equated to about one episode every three minutes. And in the workplace, where bear in mind, this was not like teaching sessions. I'm talking about just normal workplace business. This is not specific teaching sessions that happen in the workplace, but ward rounds, just general day-to-day -day workplace. Even in general day-to-day -day workplace, that 95 feedback episodes happened, and that was roughly about one every four minutes, 48 seconds. So massive amounts of feedback that was, is going on all the time. And what I found it, however, was that feedback was still likely to be delivered and instigated by the most senior person there. So there's still very much a hierarchy of information that occurs. Um, feedback was mostly verbal, but, verbal, but there was some tactile feedback, for example, in clinical skills, if a student was learning how to examine an abdomen, um, the, the tutor might press their hand on top of that student's hand and show them how deeply to palpate. Or if they were practicing putting a cannula into a prosthetic arm, the tutor would take their hand and reposition their fingers on the cannula to show them how to get a better hold. Um, there was also a bit of written feedback, non-verbal and kind of paralanguage type feedback. Feedback was rarely signposted. So only in 3% of, of cases did anyone in clinical skills and 7% in the workplace did anyone actually say, I'm going to give you some feedback here. But most feedback was dialogic, which was great. You know, so contrary to what students were saying about it being a one-way process, actually most of the feedback that I watched was dialogic or trilogic. You know, it was not just one direction, it was to and fro involving multiple people. It was really rich um, in information. Now, this last point is really key, and I want you to remember this because this is going to be important for later. In around half of all cases of feedback, there were no suggestions made for improvement. So a question would be asked, the answer would be given, or a task would be done, someone would watch and give feedback, but there was no feed forward, so no suggestion for how that, what, how that could be improved for the future, and this is really important and I'll tell you why in a mo. Um, also just really important to recognise that where the feedback is given massively influences the feedback itself. And that's because it impacts who gives it, what the environment's like, who instigates it, who receives it, what kind of learning activity type. So context, um, again, let's move beyond the information. Let's think about the context and what impact that has on the feedback that we can provide. So you remember I said that I looked at what feedback I thought had happened, but then I also showed feedback clips to um, students and tutors separately in each of the two sites. And I asked them to watch exactly the same clips and discuss them. And then I analysed that, that discussion to understand the feedback gap. And what was interesting was that students and tutors differed in a number of areas. Firstly, in terms of recognition of feedback. So, Students were less likely to see certain forms of feedback as such like tactile feedback or reflection, um, but also in terms of definition and purpose of feedback. Now, this is interesting because actually tutors, you might think it's the other way around, but it wasn't. Tutors tended to see feedback as an evaluation and a judgment and an end point. Whereas students were much more likely to see the purpose of feedback as feed forward, so learning for the next time. There was this really important and interesting information that everyone discussed about the influence of the setting on the perceptions of feedback. And one of the really things that I've taken out of my PhD that I've taken into my life just in general is that satisfaction is linked to expectation. Okay, in general. All right. 
So depending on what your expectation of feedback, um, whether you meet or don't meet that expectation is whether you, your student or your undergraduate or your postgraduate will be satisfied. And so there was this sense that the, the setting actually influenced expectations so that basically students had a much higher expectation of the, of the university type setting and therefore they were it was harder to impress them as it were whereas in the workplace their expectation was much more that the primary purpose of that place was patient care and therefore they had a lower expectation but was more satisfied by the feedback that was given in the workplace so really interesting for us all to recognize that what we need to be doing is expectation setting or at least understanding the expectations of our undergraduates, our postgraduates, because if we don't understand their expectations, they will be dissatisfied because um, we're going to have a mismatch. I think somebody's not muted just to see in case you can work out if it's you. So each setting had uh, some pros and cons about um, what made feedback better or or less able to be delivered. The workplace, so most of us would work in the clinical workplace, and um, the workplace had a greater diversity of feedback provider and inherently was seeped in credibility. So the students just love any feedback that they get from people that work on the wards because they're like, this makes sense to me, this is where I want to be, I look at these doctors, they're working in that environment, I really want feedback from them. You know, there's challenges because students absolutely hated getting feedback in front of patients if it was negative. And the reason they hated that was because particularly if they were on a longer term placement on that ward, say they got, I don't know whether it was just even asked a question in front of a patient and they got that question wrong. They then said that they felt that later if they were asked to go and take blood from that patient or interact with that patient in another way, that the patient no longer trusted their ability and that that impacted on the patient's um, impression of them. So students really, really hated getting negative feedback in front of patients. Um, whereas clinical skills had the ability to have long term relationships and also the ability to give feedback in front of patients because those patients were simu are simulated patients, they're actors or SPs. So again, it's not that one is better than the other. It's just recognizing the context and what are the affordances and challenges of each, con each context. So I want to talk about relationships. So credibility was not just person was not just about the person, but actually also task and context specific. So you might think that, for example, myself as a as a consultant in infectious diseases, I might have good credibility if I was to provide a student feedback on their choice of antibiotics, for example, or the way they speak with the patient. However, um, they may think that if I was giving them feedback on their, I don't know, their scrubbing technique, for example, that I'm not credible because it's not something that I do. So you're not either credible or not credible. Credibility is, is person task and context specific. And credibility judgments were made by students um, discussing others with their peers and watching the response of others to that feedback provider and so they're not just individually constructed but they're socially and culturally constructed so for example this person says she was a really good fy as far as i can see so like any feedback you get you're kind of like oh that's a really good pointer the nurses love her the doctors really respect her and she gets the jobs done so this fifth year student on his foundation apprenticeship is watching this FY and watching the way all the nurses and the doctors respond to that FY. He has decided that everyone thinks she's a good FY and therefore the feedback that he gets from her is the feedback that he wants. Um, students talked about you know, positive relationships, about content and delivery, but relationships were really important. Um, uh, yeah, as we've discussed, negative experiences related to emotional impact and poor relationships. Tutors still seem to conceptualise feedback as tutor driven and delivered. And I think we need to get away from this. We need to understand that the learning happens in the learner and the feedback therefore needs to be feedback driven. Um, and how we do that is, is challenging, but I'm going to come on to some educational suggestions in a wee minute. Um, 
tutors didn't seem to recognize the importance of relationships, whereas in relationships were really important to the students. So I think this is really important for us to understand as tutors that our relationships and our credibility is key to whether they're going to listen to anything we tell them. We might be giving them the most amazing feedback, the most like golden nugget of information, but if they think that we are, for want of a better term, a tit, then they're not going to listen to that. Excuse my language, but that's the truth. So if we think about the feedback gap at medical school in UK, um, there's a couple of things. The gaps were in the purpose of feedback. So tutors still getting to this evaluative endpoint, this judgment, this end, but students wanting to understand how can I be better for next time? And also there is a recognition gap in what people seem to think of as feedback. So I recognise as an NHS clinician that sometimes some of the criticism of the med ed literature is that it's all very theoretical and then people are saying, so what? How can I actually apply that in my educational context? So I what I just want to spend the next five or 10 minutes having a wee think about what we how we could use this information to maybe apply this to our undergraduate and postgraduate training contexts. So what I want you to think about is if you're an a undergraduate teacher or if you're a postgraduate educational supervisor, that satisfaction is linked to expectation. You need to set the expectation early or at least understand the expectation of your trainee. And if you co-construct expectations and then meet those expectations, you will have great outcomes in terms of um, satisfaction with feedback, okay? So you need to really set expectations. You need to understand what their expectations are because it may well be that whilst you're being used to meeting someone, you know, once every four months, that in their previous, I don't know, placement, that they met their tutor every week. And so, of course, there's going to be dissatisfaction if something's different now compared to what they had previously or vice versa. And it's not to say that what you need to do is what other people did. But what it is important to do is for you to say, OK, this is what we do here. This is what I will try and do for you. And this is how, how and when we can meet. And, and then once you set those expectations, you need to meet them. So I'm sorry for the slightly chintzy slide, but it's the truth. How they feel matters. And this slide is really important and particularly with regards to feedback. So they won't really remember what you said or what you did, but they will remember how that thing made you, how you made them feel. So how, when you were providing feedback, even if it was some disaster that went wrong with a patient or something, but you do it in a way that is supportive, that is reflective, that is, uh, provides feed forward, then that will be a positive feedback experience. If you make them feel negatively towards the, the whatever has gone on or negatively towards the feedback, then that feedback will be conceptualized as negative. It also matters how you feel, because I think we have to recognize that this is a two-way process. And you know what? If you're having a bad day, you've not had lunch, you were phoned six times last night on your own call, and then a trainee does something that you feel warrants feedback, but actually you have to recognize, am I in the right frame of mind to provide constructive feedback? Or would it be better, a bit like never send an, an angry email, might it be better to wait until you have had some food, you are in a better place before you sit down and, and have provide that feedback to them? So this is the thing that's really confronting for us and I think is important for us to consider. Does that person think I am any good? Am I any good? Am I the right person to provide feedback on this thing? How do I know that and how do I show that? So how do you demonstrate your credibility? How do you know your credibility? And, and be honest with yourself because if you're not the best person in the thing that you were about to provide feedback on, then don't do it. Find the person that is and get them to provide the feedback on or at least get multi-source feedback. Because if you're not credible, there's no point. It, it's, it's a wasted experience for both you and the, the trainee or the undergraduate. Relationships. Do they believe I have their interest at heart? Why are you giving the feedback? Is it because you get half a session in your job plan and you're just doing it because, you know, you have to justify it because it's in your job plan? Or are you doing it because you anticipate that this person will be your future colleague, that you really want to support them, that you want to help them to become the best doctor that they can be? 
what have you done to build a relationship with that person? Um, have you seen them as a as a human separately to uh, somebody who's doing the jobs at work or a human separately to being an undergraduate in this particular teaching session? What is their and your feedback legacy? So recognizing that feedback does not happen in a vacuum. Think, reflect in yourself, like what feed, what is my feedback legacy? Am I giving feedback based on what worked for me? But actually, is that not the right thing for this student? What actually would work better for them? Um, so recognizing that previous feedback experiences in both the student and the tutor will influence the feedback success. Thinking about feed forward in that slide, I show you where 50% of the feedback provided no feed forward at all. I want you to look back and forward. So it's really important to recognize where they've come from and to point out, look, you know, the first time you did this, you didn't, you did, you missed X, Y, and Z. Now you, now you really managed to do X and Y, but for next time you also need to do Z. So look back and forward because feedback without feed forward is just standing still and you're not going to help them develop. And then how do you role model responsive feedback? At your institution, how do you deal with feedback and evaluation? How do you show that you also value, that you reflect and that you do something that with the feedback that you're given? How do you personally feel when you get feedback? Do you, you know, when you've had a bad day and you get a complaint from a patient, do you deal with that well? Do you just get really annoyed and, and send a really angry email about it? How do you role model the way you respond to feedback? Can you share a complaint with your trainee and say, this is how this made me feel and I was really hacked off at this time, but then I, you know, I waited two days and then I wrote this or vice versa. How can we role model how we respond to feedback? So I'm just going to take you back to this original slide that I showed at the beginning, which was about this tutor as information, this feedback as information model, which really looked at feedback that as a unidirectional process from one person to the other but we know from hopefully you've understood from all of the things that i've shared with you today that the information is one percent of the feedback experience two percent you know it's all of these other factors these filters the context all of these other things that are ultimately going to impact feedback success so rather than this as the feedback model Feedback is more something like this. It's about all of these factors that influence feedback, the, the relationship, the individual factors, the social factors, the cultural factors. And um, if we are to improve feedback at an undergraduate level, at a postgraduate training level, um, between ourselves and our patients, between ourselves and our colleagues, we have to recognize each of these factors, not just one of them, not just the information, not just um, you know, the relationship, but all of these factors have to be addressed before we're going to make any improvement with feedback. And so I will stop there and um, invite questions. Thanks very much, Lynn. <laughs> I remember all too well you um uh doing that bit of research because you followed me around with a camera on a ward round and some feedback um sessions that, that i did as a relatively new consultant it was absolutely terrifying <laughs> i remember but i was interested to hear the first time around that that um we're giving a lot of feedback it's just not necessarily recognized and um and the having heard your talk five six seven years ago and the uh, the extra insight that you now have as a more experienced educator and and consultant i think that's really gives an extra dimension to your to your work um so i really enjoyed your talk thank you very much thank you um uh does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask i feel like i should give you an, some uh, tips for improvement feeding forwards lynn but uh, <laughs> I, i'm gonna go and have something to eat first before i uh, tackle that <laughs> is it don't say the word tit when you're doing grand round <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think it's uh, entirely reasonable to say the word tit during grand round that's fine <laughs> sometimes only one word describes exactly what you mean has anybody got any any questions comments um or just... yeah it's Kis kismet here one of the consultant neurosurgeons um, hello kismet thank you for I... joining uh, I'm I'm now fifty percent clinical skills tutor, so um so I've had a bit of a baptism by fire since July uh, of teaching undergraduates as opposed to postgraduates, and um it's fascinating that when you said that you videoed the clinical skills scenario that we're providing feedback every minute, 
um, or minute and four seconds or whatever it was. So, um, and, and I can see that because, for example, uh, um, the, the year one students are, are learning how to examine an abdomen. And as a, as a surgeon, obviously, that's the kind of thing I've done thousands of times. So, uh, and I do put my hand on their hand and get them to palpate deeply and spoon shaped and all the kind of stuff that we as doctors take for granted, but they've never done before. Um, but some of the things that I feel more awkward about, and maybe I can get your advice about, are, are the nonverbal communication skills. And, you know, I give them advice on tone of voice, posture, um, try to avoid dress, but because most of them are dressed quite well. Um, and I wonder if sometimes I kind of try to make a joke out of it. And, and I just want, and I haven't got into trouble yet, but uh, I think I've just been put on alert. But like when Tom said he was terrified that you're videoing him, I'm not thinking, crikey, what am I doing wrong? Um, but um, my, my feedback so far seems to be okay from the students, but I, I just wondered if there's anything that you could advise about those subtle things about, you know, um, non-verbal communication skills and just, just acting the doctor part that they might take personally, that we can depersonalize and make more professional in our feedback. I hope that's a, an okay question. Yeah, I think that is, and I think it is something that comes up, but I, I agree with you. It's something that we have to be careful about um, because feedback that relates to physical characteristics of individuals is a very tricky thing to get, you know, to that would be a very difficult thing. So, um, there's been some Twitter storms. I don't know if you follow various med-ed Twitter people about people who've had feedback on on their outfits during all skis and various things and how really inappropriate that is. Um, and as someone that works with the medical school, we actually read all the feedback that comes from the examiners before we send it out to the medical students to sift out some of the things that might be written that are, quite frankly, not appropriate. Um, so I honestly would not provide feedback on someone's physical dress. What is important, I, or certainly, certainly not in front of others. Yeah. What is important, I think, is that there are clear expectations. You know, we talked about expectations and satisfaction. So clear expectations set by the medical school at the off, which is, you know, if the expectation is you're dressed as though you're going to be on the wards, and seeing patients, then that's fine. Um, but if, if that expectation has never been set, and then actually you as a tutor thinks, oh, I'm annoyed that they're wearing jeans, but no one's ever said to them, jeans isn't really what we would want or whatever, then, then that's going to be an expectation mismatch from the student because they're not expecting that. So I definitely, I think it's important that clear information is provided about dress sense and things like that I wouldn't provide information about a physical someone's physical appearance um yeah. I, don't, I don't mind about the dress sense as much because yeah. that was say there's a very clear code of conduct that they they seem to follow for clinical skills it's yeah. more about that non-verbal communication being confident I'm trying to you know the thing that I stress every tutorial is be kind yet confident people want a diagnosis you know you need to have a certain authority about you which is hard for a year one student but they seem to get it but I just I just wonder if there's a fine line that I'm treading um I think my get out of jail free card is that I am very open in the discussion and, I, and everyone when you said that there's it's kind of tripartite or bipartite and everyone's involved in it and that, so it isn't victimization I think I think that's how I get away with it but I just wondered about your advice on that that non-verbal communication skills. One of the benefits of clinical skills is because you're developing a longer term relationship with the student and hopefully across that time period they, they build trust in you and therefore feel that you have their interests at heart they're going to be more open to critical feedback if that mm -hmm. makes sense mm -hmm. so I think that is one of the benefits of the clinical skills teaching that they come you know every week for three years and they build up a trust in the the staff and therefore kind of those sort of feedback characteristics are are easier or yeah more um challenging feedback is actually easier if you have a good relationship with someone thank you I thought your comments, uh, Lynn, about setting the expectation are particularly important. I'm just about to go and do a clinic and it's a busy clinic um, and I've got students with me and my ability to spend a lot of time teaching them um, uh, the opportunities to for all the students to examine every patient and provide feedback are going to be very limited. Um, and I sometimes feel 
sort of embarrassed isn't the right word, but I feel bad that I'm saying to them, the first thing I say to them after introducing myself is that this is going to be very busy. I don't think you're going to have very many opportunities to, to learn things. It's going to be very passive. I'll do what I can. I'm sorry. And I feel like I'm a bit on the back foot. But listening to you, perhaps that's actually a good thing to do to set the scene. And, uh, and so long as I'm able to catch up at the end. Is that a reasonable? Yeah, I students are very very open to most things and in most cases particularly just now Tom they're just delightful to have clinical contact you know because of COVID they haven't had so much so I being just being honest and setting expectation whatever that expectation is as long as the expectation is clear people are much more I'm going to do it with my patients the same thing um if you've got particularly nasty cellulitis, for example, um, my standard pattern for my patient is, you know, imagine that you'd accidentally poured a kettle of boiling water over your leg. Um, the bug is behaving like a burn. It's damaged the top layer of skin that all has to come off and it's going to take weeks and weeks for your leg to look better. Because if I don't expectation set with my patient, what will happen is I'll discharge them and they'll not look better within three days and they'll think that that means the infection's still there and they'll go back to their GP and then the GP will then potentially send them back in again or certainly get back in touch. Whereas if you just expectation set, your leg is going to look gammy for six weeks, then they know to expect a gammy leg for six weeks. It's just, it's just it's this expectation satisfaction is so important and everything we do in medicine, um, if we did it, for our patients we did it for our teaching for our training I feel like it would solve about 90% of the dissatisfaction. Susie has a hand up. Nice I to see you Susie. do. Hi thank you very much Lynn. Um, really really interesting. Uh, I, I wondered also about the emotion of the of the feedback giver uh, whether uh, you'd looked at all into that um, thinking about you know how they feel about building the relationship what what the barriers are I mean Tom's just highlighted a very good one about you've got that you've got patience you've got this you've got that you've got those time pressures um, and, uh, and and what we could do to help our faculty with with recognizing their own emotions um, and how that might impact yeah, so I think at the time, I didn't look at that specifically as part of the research that I did because it wasn't really one of the research questions. It's just more something that's kind of come out as of beyond and as I've kind of done some more, more experience just myself individually, but then also reading around it. I think it is just recognising that the emotions are important, but that it's a two that as you say the emotions of both the trainee and the feedback provider are important and that like I was saying that if you require are required to provide feedback but actually you've not eaten that day you were on call last night you're really tired you um are desperate for a wee and only have three minutes maybe that's not the right time to have an important feedback conversation and actually a better thing to do even though you might think they'd be disappointed if you cancel a feedback or supervision meeting an actual better thing would, to do would be to say i really want to spend time with you helping you develop i'm probably not having a great day today because a patient died or i'm hungry or whatever and i really want to do this well for you so could we find another time next week and and then I and I on I think that would be well received. Yeah, thanks. Sarah Martins de Silva, I assume that is, um, has asked a question: Is there a difference in postgraduate feedback where, where formal, for example, work-based place assessment, compared to informal in terms of sat expectation satisfaction? I I honestly don't really think so. I think, um, well, I think the theories are the same in that you people will have an expectation if you're the supervisor you need to kind of understand what that expectation is now maybe a different expectation in a postgraduate than an undergraduate but the per the point is there will be an expectation that you need to understand as a supervisor and that expectation may be wildly unrealistic and but so part of being a supervisor might be that you have to understand if they have wildly unrealistic expectations and help reset those expectations for your trainee or somehow meet somewhere in the middle. Um, so, I mean, I think in postgraduate training, we often develop longer relationships, particularly in Tayside, because we don't move around as much. And that's one of the real benefits of training in Tayside is, you know, people often spend three, four years, three, four, five years post gradually you know as a registrar or whatever in the same place as opposed to another bigger centers they might move around and maybe not develop those longitudinal relationships so much it can also be a downside that if you you know have a supervisor who you haven't got on with 
and they are supposed to be your supervisor for the same five years, that that's actually detrimental. And I think we probably have to have some sort of policy which allows grad postgraduates to flag up if they feel that the relationship between their supervisor and themselves is not a positive one and allows the opportunity for a different supervisor. Tom, I don't know if that's something that we've ever considered, but I think it is something that might be useful because I think if the relationship isn't there, that it's, it's um, you know, then the feedback is not going to be successful. Uh, yeah, it's a really important point in postgraduate training. Um, my experience of the last five years of being associate dean is that, um, that usually it's too late that trainees or trainers um, flag it up as an issue by the time it's become a crisis. Uh, and at that point, often it's, it turns into from, it turns from being rubbing against the wrong way to an, or a mismatch into sometime more overt aggression. And then, it, and you still have to work with these people and in whatever role, even if it's not as a supervisor, supervisee. So, and we do, obviously we do move people. We, we find another supervisor. What we'd like to do is to flag it up much earlier and then have a sort of, you know, have a dialogue um, where you can say, oh, Lynn, you're my supervisor. I, I, and and I, I hear what you're saying, but I just find the way that our interactions are, are really, our um, personalities are just a little bit too different. And I'm finding it very difficult to be open and honest with you. Can we find someone else rather than it going down the line and being a big argument? That's not an easy thing to do. And I think it's very difficult for trainees, particularly more junior trainees, I'm thinking foundation and, and, and core trainees, to front up to me or more people more senior than me and say, I respect you as a clinician, but as an educator and a trainer, I, I, I'd like someone else. That's a very hard conversation to have. So, or um, the opposite, Tom, because oh, let's oh, yeah. face it, they might, they might think not you specifically, you know, but there might be a trainee, for example, who looks at their, their senior and thinks that they're a bit crap and therefore doesn't respect them. And I don't think there's a good process just now for us to, that's a really complex, complex thing, but it will impact on their training. Yeah, that, and that's an even more difficult thing, I think, if it starts off as a, if it's a the, the trainee genuinely thinks they're just hopeless that's a very difficult conversation to have um and, and of course the dme is here um to, to to ensure the quality of training of trainers to make sure that people have recognition of training and have updates and are topped up so that we can try to quality assure the quality of training trainers and of course that's why quality visits happen so um when the deanery comes to visit and we we ask for honest feedback from trainer trainees about their trainers you know is there a good relationship are you getting that are you getting feedback appropriately and and is it and what do you feel like we're changing the questions more from have you got your five acats this year to how do you feel about your training and how do you feel about the feedback so that kind of thing it, it's not an easy fix but we're certainly looking into it one time for one last question which is from l nicholas who says fascinating topic and very useful is it an area of research that you're still involved in? Uh, what are the areas that further research should focus on? I feel like I'm back in my PhD viva there. <laughs> Where do you take this now? Um, no, thank you. Um, I So after doing my PhD, I then went back into finishing off my clinical training and then was a consultant and then COVID happened. So um, basically for various reasons, like lots of people, I haven't had the feedback. <laughs> Uh, or to do research. However, um, I recently was appointed as assessment lead for the university. I started that about October time. And a part of that will be to think about the research strategy going forward with regards to the assessment. And so, hi. So, um, definitely looking towards feedback. And the thing is, uh, feedback and assessment, there's, you know, the field is so vast. It's thinking about what we can do to. Um, to, to look at it so we're having a wee think about what our priorities might be and um, the medical licensing assessments coming in for medical schools so this post this uh, um so a lot of our focus is around things like that but other important things like differential attainment and um, various factors related to assessment and so we're we're looking going forward because the assessment lead post didn't exist before so now that that's in place having a wee think about how we can uh move the research agenda forward Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, 
And uh, I think that draws things to a close, Lynn. Um, we have time to get to clinic and the afternoon's activities where I will set expectations and do my best to have dialogue based feedback with all those who join me in the clinic. And some feed uh, forward, and some feed forward. And uh, definitely feeding forward, that's the, that's the key thing to say. No, thank you, Lynn. Uh, it's always nice to hear an expert talk about something and, and uh, welcome to back to Grand Rounds and uh, thank you very much. Everyone, this will go on YouTube in due course um, and look out for next week's email for the next week's Grand Round. Thanks very much, take care, have a good weekend. Thank you everyone, thank you.